to hear me clearly on our Zoom conference this evening? Yes, Congressman, this is Troy Torres, thank you. Okay, wonderful, thank you. We were having some technical difficulties and I needed to update my platform, so I apologize for our slight delay. Um, earlier this evening, about one hour ago, we sent out a press release um, to our media partners, providing them some updated information on some of the relief that we're going to be bringing. I'm sorry, not relief, some of the um, infrastructure funding that we're going to be um, uh, potentially bringing to our territory um, in the um, weeks and months ahead. Uh, upon transmittal of that press release, a number of you reached out. Recording in uh, progress. Upon, a num upon the transmittal of our press release to media partners, a number of you have reached out to our office asking that we actually host a Zoom call to be able to field questions from you. And so we're very grateful for um, your Okay. <laughs> Are we good? <laughs> Very grateful for your feedback and we thank you for um, working so hard on such short notice to make your platforms available to your listening audience. I'd like to thank my staff as well for um, um, working extra, extra expeditiously to be able to put the infrastructure together for us to be able to uh, accommodate this request from you folks. And so um, without further ado, we'll go ahead and begin uh, on outlining the items that we mentioned in our press release and also some additional items that you may have some queries on. Uh, first and foremost, relative to the press release we sent out an hour ago, um, the Natural Resources Committee is going to be including approximately $993 million in total funding for territories, uh, specifically for medical and hospital facilities. And um, relative to Guam, we are estimating um, on, the, on the low end, approximately 340 to $345 million dollars. Um, of that funding allotment will come to, to Guam if we are able to successfully pass it. That was what I pushed out in the press release, but let me go ahead and back up a little bit to give you guys some greater um, uh, perspective. There are three major vehicles that are moving through the Congress. We've been working very hard over the last several months um, to make sure that our um, territorial interests are included in all three of these major vehicles. The first one is the infrastructure bill. Um, that's approximately $1.5 trillion. The second is a $3.5 trillion budget reconciliation bill. And the third is the um, annual appropriations package. So let me go ahead and break down um, what's in each of these three major vehicles, and then we'll, we'll field questions upon my conclusion. First, in the $1.5 trillion infrastructure package, this was actually the amount that was um, negotiated between the Senate and the House. The Senate actually passed their version and the House has their version as well. The good news um, is that while the original House version was, was greater than the Senate's version, the Senate's final price tag was the um, approximate 1.5 trillion. The good news is we were able to make sure that all of Guam's provisions that I outlined in my congressional address at the end of June, we were able to secure all of Guam's provisions, even in the reduced amount. So for the infrastructure package, we are still anticipating $20 million um, specifically for bus shelters. We are still anticipating access to about $5.25 billion in um, discretionary and competitive grants that can be used to purchase um, buses and electric buses. And we are still anticipating an increase in our federal highway funding from roughly 15 to 18 million to about 43 to 45 million. So um, those are the three major items that we're going to be um, looking at securing in the infrastructure package. Um, and those are the three items that we did outline in our congressional address in the end of June. We're very, very grateful for leadership to um, uh, work with us in making sure that even though the final price tag dropped by almost 50%, we were still able to keep 100% of the items that we were able to itemize um, to the people several months ago. Um, that's the infrastructure package. On the budget reconciliation package, this one is also moving forward um, and, and we're, we're going to be rolling out what we are able to have secured as language in this um, as it becomes available. And so the first um, uh, committee that we're able to um, update the people on is a natural resources committee. And in that committee, as I mentioned earlier, there's $993 million that's targeted for medical facilities and hospital funding for territories, of which $345 million is estimated to be going to Guam. We're hoping that this amount is going to um, allow for um, us to uh, finally secure full federal funding um, for the um, um, hospital needs rather than us using uh, relief funding for that purpose. 
Our feedback has been um, a mixed bag in terms of whether or not the governor's original intention for that 300 million will actually be um, aligned with the American Rescue Plan. There has been no commitment federally that using those relief funds for that purpose was going to be authorized. So we are hopeful that this 345 million in the budget reconciliation is going to um, successfully move forward. We did, <coughs> excuse me, we did attempt this last year. But the challenge that we had last year was last year's budget reconciliation attempts were specifically for COVID-19 relief, emergency relief, and not necessarily for uh, infrastructure investments. In this case, the, um, the entire tenor of, uh, of this reconciliation package has been very infrastructure focused. And so we're confident that um, uh, in, in line with maintaining that theme, this funding source should be available um, and should be considered uh, more seriously than it was last year. Uh, we have additional items in the reconciliation package that we're still waiting to um, price out. Um, one of them is going to be um, trying to secure funding for elderly and disability housing facilities uh, through the Financial Services Committee and the funding that they're going to be working with uh, on the reconciliation package. We've also been communicating very heavily with our colleagues on the Restaurant Relief Fund, trying to secure additional monies for that. The Restaurant Relief Fund was a package of the American Rescue Plan that was providing uh, money for restaurants that were suffering from distress. And um, unfortunately, the um, funding and the Restaurant Relief Fund that was initially authorized was insufficient. There have been several movements to try and refund that uh, funding source. We've co-sponsored and we've led actually several um, attempts to work on co-sponsors for a full funding of that package. We brought co-sponsors up to about 212 co-sponsors on that so far. everyone we're having a little bit of technical difficulties if you can just give us a, a moment thank you Okay, can someone, can someone quickly let me know where I left off? <laughs> Congressman, uh, the last uh, I heard you were, this is Troy, by the way, you were talking about the restaurant relief program. You were just starting to talk about it and then it cut off. 
Okay, great. Let me go ahead and just jump in right there. So the Restaurant Relief Fund was originally funded um, through the American Rescue Plan. The amounts that were estimated for that fund, unfortunately, were insufficient. And so we've um, gotten involved and we've also provided some leadership in trying to get more funding into that fund. Um, there was a bill that originated in the House to fully fund the Restaurant Relief Fund. We were able to get about 212 co-sponsors on, on that, but unfortunately, the Senate signaled that they were not interested in, um, in rolling out um, about a $75 billion um, refunding of that fund. They came back with a counter offer that's roughly 25% of that. And so we're going to see where the final dollar figure falls in terms of getting the restaurant relief um, fund um, fully um, funded or partially funded. But one of the things that we did um, uh, become aware of when we received the restaurant relief fund report was that the territories actually on a proportional basis received less than um, other states um, that were also um, receiving funding from the RRF. And so one of the things that we're going to be doing is communicating with the committee, communicating with the body, and communicating with the agency to at least require them to true up our portion if any new money is provided before new money gets rolled out to take whatever is provided and first make the territories whole on an equal basis, and then from there, continue to roll out the program. The reason why we wanna do that is because at least we're gonna put ourselves on an equal playing field. We're still trying to nail down the basis for why our restaurant relief funding was less than other jurisdictions. Um, some theories are that the RRF required IRS certification, and because our revenue tax all territory revenue tax, not just Guam, but all the territories, our tax authorities are not um, IRS, we're outside of IRS. And so that may have created a disconnect in the funding mechanisms, but that was never the intent of the law or of the program. So we're going to um, work as hard as we can to try and at least true up all of the Guam um, uh, applications outstanding to at least be on a level basis with everyone else that's already received funding, and then from there, any new funding um, to also be distributed on a level basis. Um, so that's some, um, so the um, hospital money and the restaurant relief funding so far I can comment on, um, both will likely be included on the reconciliation, that second vehicle. Um, we also have work being done on the shuttered venue operator grant program. Uh, we have a major venue, a major operator that's um, still awaiting approval. We've been working diligently to try and and see how how um, we can assist in uh, getting that that application expeditiously reviewed. Uh, and if there are any other um, entities out there that apply to the shuttered venue operator grant program, please let our office know so that we can also follow up and see where where we can assist in trying to get um, your application properly um, assessed. The third vehicle, the appropriations package, um, that one is probably going to move later um, than the first two, if not simultaneously, but I would, I would think later. Um, and the big news on that one is a $3 million that we mentioned for the Fisherman's Co-op. We were able to ensure that was included in the appropriations package. So everything that we've pressed out over the last 12 months, 12 to 18 months, and everything that we've announced so far uh, continues to track on, a, on forward progress. Um, and as these things firm up, we're going to be um, channeling back to the people of Guam and through our media partners uh, to be able to apprise our people of the situation. Um, specifically to the $345 million for the hospital, that's going to be included in a, um, in a markup session that we're going to be having in the Natural Resources Committee uh, that is anticipated for September 2nd. So in the next several days um, um, at the conclusion of this week, we should be able to see whether or not we're going to be um, securing those funds and moving them into the actual reconciliation package. Let me go ahead and pause here and um, turn it over to our moderator for any um, to moderate any questions from our media partners. Thank you. Off day, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. If you have a question, um, we will now be opening up the floor and uh, please feel free to let us know in the chat if you do, and we'll get to those questions in the order we receive them. Um, first, we'd like to recognize Mr. Ken Leon Guerrero. Thank you. I Sorry, Congressman, this is Ashley Troy Torres. Uh, I think Ken used my, my laptop, so that's why the Zoom is on Ken. Anyway, 
Uh, here's me. It's my then Troy, not him. So um, uh, this uh, on the hospital thing on the three hundred forty-five million dollars for the hospital. Uh, what is the likelihood uh, this is going to get passed? We will have to see. Um, right now, the political environment is just very unpredictable. Um, we have a 50-50 Senate that ultimately is going to, um, again, determine what's going to uh, be included in the final, final package. But both chambers authorize a $3.5 trillion uh, plate, if you want to look at it like that, like a fiesta plate, right? And so on this $3.5 trillion fiesta plate, we're going to have some red rice, some chicken, some spare ribs, some caliguin. You know, so Natural Resources Committee, let's say that's the, the red rice. We have a certain amount of red rice that we're allowed to put on that plate. Natural Resources is on the, on the House side committing for that $345 million to be part of that red rice, if I can help break it down that way. And so because both the Senate and the House agreed to the, the size of the plate, um, as long as we're not going over, then we should be able to continue to you know, move our, our measure forward. What makes this year different from last year is that the dollar amount of the budget reconciliation package was not predetermined last year. Um, it was first moved forward through the House, then the Senate came and we had to negotiate different numbers and certain things did not go through. In this instance, the, the Senate actually came first and they said, this is how much we're gonna say yes to. And now the house is coming forward, um, matching what it is that they're saying yes to. And we are including our, our amount in that, um, in that package. Um, also because the hospital funding is directly correlated to infrastructure. And because this funding round is very infrastructure focused, that's another check mark that's going to really, I think put wind in our sails to get this thing through. So as far as probabilities of us getting this passed, I can't guarantee it, but I can say that we're definitely in a much better place this year than we were last year. And um, are you uh, are you saying in, in this push for uh, the uh, this way of funding uh, GMH, uh, is this is this also a way of saying to the governor, you know, governor, uh, you could use that three hundred million dollars on on other things? And if so, what are those other things you are suggesting she might? want to use that money for? Absolutely. We really want to free up that 300 million. And, and here's why, you know, just several months ago, um, the Delta variant was not manifesting itself as, as obviously as it is today. And, and with the Delta variant, our circumstances have really um, changed dramatically in terms of outlooks for recovery. What looked like a four to six month return of tourism now is likely going to be a six, nine, or 12 month return to tourism. And so with PUA expiring in less than a week um, and with our source markets far from reactivation, um, we, are, we are quite a ways from economic normalcy. And so the um, ability for our uh, local job market to be able to absorb the, um, the individuals who are coming off of PUA with its, with its um, sunset uh, is very, very tenuous. And so the um, administration has already made it very clear. We can use that 600 million to carry forward PUA, either as is or adjust it in a way that's going to work a little bit better for us. And we can use the infrastructure that was purchased and put in place by past relief funding rounds. We can use that to continue running the program. So that's option one. Another option is that we can also use those funds to pay for essential workers. Now, doing both will help keep money circulating in, a, in our economy at a time when we do not have our source markets bringing those monies in organically. And so um, as much as everybody wants to, uh, of course, move forward a hospital project, and as much as I support that, um, the, the purpose of the relief funds, first and foremost, was for relief. And so rather than getting into a tug of war argument over, you know, you should use the money for this or you should use the money for that, we're going to come in and try to provide a solution. Hopefully we're able to secure these federal dollars for that purpose and then make the problem solve itself. Take that three million, use it to, to deploy resources to our people and, and do so very, very soon so that this um, lag time between our organic tourism recovery isn't going to devastate us in the next three to six months. Thank you, Congressman. That's all I have for now. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you for your questions, Troy. Now we'll be taking a question from PNC Digital. Uh, no, Congressman, my, my question was asked already by Troy. But, uh, well, on, on, on another topic, uh, th there's been talk of another stimulus package being uh, formulated. Do you, do you know anything about that? No, there, I, at this time, and, and you guys know me, if I have any, the reason why we, we don't share information until we're, we're fairly firm on it is because we don't want to create unreasonable expectations. These items that we're sharing in this press, press conference, we've actually been working on for the past several months, multiple months, but we're only bringing it forward now because we're seeing that it's actually going to materialize into concrete steps. Um, I, I have not seen any concrete steps towards any further stimulus. Um, the realities are that while the Delta variant is definitely a global concern, the economic circumstances of our various um, U.S. jurisdictions are, are nowhere near the same. So Guam, for example, Delta is going to Delta is going to hurt us today. It's likely going to hurt us for the next nine to 12 months, six, nine, 12 months. The U.S. economy is not, you know, as tourism dependent as ours is. It's more consumer spending driven. And because we have, you know, things opening up over here and a lot more consumer spending activities really ramping up. I mean, it's one of the reasons why we've seen a lot of improvement in U.S. job markets. We've seen a lot of improvement in U.S. equity markets. We've seen a lot of improvement, actually a little too much improvement in, um, in um, producer prices and um, consumer prices because demand is outstripping supply and it's causing some temporary inflation. So as far as another round of stimulus, I don't see too much of an appetite for that out here with respect to what's going on across the country. So I'm, I'm not comfortable publicly stating that another round of stimulus is likely. If that, if that changes, we will absolutely let, let you all know. But right now, I, I, would, I would focus us on using what we have to meet what we need. So, so Congressman, I imagine the same is true for, for the unemployment package, right? Uh, that it won't be uh, extended past uh, September 4, despite the letter sent by, I think there were two Biden cabinet officials who, uh, who, who were lobbying for an extension. So uh, you, you are correct. Yeah. The administration has been very plain about its desire to pretend to perhaps um, continue the, the um, unemployment program. That has not had any traction thus far. Um, there's just way too much debate on the ground about whether or not the unemployment program nationally is depressing um, job demand. And so it's just a real difficult political area to, um, to really tackle nationally at this time. I can say locally that um, while PUA has been, you know, uh, an actual increase in the quality of life for a lot of our people relative to their take home pay, um, once PUA turns off, there's not going to be a whole lot of jobs waiting for people to, to fill into. Because again, our economic circumstances are just very different from the rest of the country. And so as of right now, I can say that uh, even though the Biden administration has extended requests for um, reconsideration of more unemployment support, uh, congressionally that has not found traction, uh, but that could change. If PUA expires in the days ahead, if the Delta variant starts showing up in economic contraction on a national basis, and if the absence of PUA does not materially change the unemployment or the job demand situation, um, then those things may come back onto the table. But as of right now, that is, that is, that is not the case. Okay, thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. We'll now move on and recognize Mr. Nestor Lacanto from KUAM News. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman, for this opportunity. Um, so I just want to get back to the 345 million. So it's going into a markup later this week, correct? It, and can you uh, elaborate on the verbiage? Uh, is, is it uh, a uh, line item within the 993 million for the other territories? The 993 million is going to be distributed based on um, a formulaic basis. So on a percentage basis, likely to be population driven. The 993 million does not include Puerto Rico. So it's going to be Guam, US Virgin Islands, Commonwealth, Northern Marianas, American Samoa. And so because of the four, um, we are uh, the largest with Virgin Islands very close behind us. 
that's how the percentages are going to be breaking down. And so it's going to be formulaic based on the 993 likely population uh, on a percentage basis. Okay, and so if it makes out of it makes it out of the natural resources markup session, where, where does it go from there? And then um, I guess if it uh, if it uh, when would we know um, when it's locked up? Because presumably uh, the governor wouldn't want to spend her three hundred million from the ARP until she knows that the three forty five is for sure. Well, on that note, you know, I think that we need to put the hospital timeline in perspective. You know, we're not going to have a $300 million hospital price tag tomorrow or even in the next six months. We're talking about a, a maybe five year project, you know, with different um, milestones to be met. The first of which that the governor committed to is doing a charrette to be able to determine what our overall healthcare facility campus is going to look like, what kind of um, what kind of work we're going to want to do for that, and using Army Corps of Engineers to be able to put that package together. That in and of itself is going to take, you know, at the best case scenario, one year. After the charrette is completed, we're going to have to go in and do architectural and engineering, the actual drawing of the designs and the square footage, the depth of the pilings, all that kind of stuff. That, you know, ideally on a, on, on a, on a perfect day will take a year. And then, of course, we have construction, which could take between, you know, three to five years, depending on, you know, how perfect of a construction environment we have, storms, any kind of change orders, any kind of unforeseen circumstances. So, you know, to, to take 300 million in relief money that was intended for relief at a time when we have immediate relief needs on the horizon and to park that and put that away for something that's going to have a five to seven year timeline, um, yeah, we really shouldn't do that. We should definitely allocate portions of it to meet the certain milestones. So the charrette will be about $3 million of the 300 million. We can definitely put 3 million aside to pay for that. Architectural engineering could perhaps be upwards of five to $10 million. And then of course we have the, 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 the various stages of project development after that. So I know it was lengthy, but my point is, you know, hospital funding or not, we need to really, we need to really weigh the benefits of, of tying that money up for something that's going to have a very long horizon and different funding opportunities. We can go into the bond market, we can fund it with general fund dollars. There's just different ways of, of meeting that project need. Our ability to meet um, crisis relief funding needs is, is, is far more limited, and that's what that money was originally intended for. On top of that, Nestor, we still have not gotten firm um, uh, approval from Treasury that the $300 million in the American Rescue Plan can in fact be used to build a hospital. So we're kind of setting money aside, and we don't even know if that money can actually be used for that purpose for a timeline that we know is going to be far longer than the immediate needs in front of us that we know we can use it for like paying essential workers or like running a pool program or scaling it to, you know, tourism recovery and the job market improving. I mean, there's just so many different things we can do. But that being said, um, after we pass it in markup, it's going to go to the budget committee. And as long as it meets all of the rules to be included in the budget, it's going to be included. And right now, the committees are very, very careful about making sure nothing passes markup that isn't already going to clear the committee, the, the, the committee budget process. So on the House side, once we clear markup, we should be okay. The real question is going to be, once we pass the budget reconciliation side on the House, will our language match up with what's being passed in the Senate? And so again, that's going to be the final hurdle. It's going to perhaps be our biggest hurdle. We're working on communicating with our colleagues in the Senate to be able to uh, firm up their, their support for that funding mechanism. And uh, you know, again, because it's an infrastructure related expense for an infrastructure focused reconciliation package, we're confident we're gonna be able to, to, to at least get some positive feedback on that. But what we will do is while I cannot guarantee that 345 million today, I can promise that as we move this process forward, we're going to be keeping everybody fully informed so we know what the realities on the ground are and whether or not that funding source is finally going to materialize, not only on the house side, which I'm pretty confident on, but also on the Senate side. I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. And, and, and so is the 345, um, is that um, just kind of a, a blank check, if you will, as long as it's used for a, a medical uh, facility or hospital? Or are there, are there restrictions to its use? Generally speaking, it's going to be pretty open-ended because budget reconciliations are very careful about not putting provisions in there 
that cross the line from being just entirely budget oriented. And so that's one of the examples of why, like for example, the 600 million the governor got on the American Rescue Plan, it's very open-ended because the American Rescue Plan was in actuality a budget reconciliation measure. And so budget, re budget recons are really just provisions of funds, general purposes for use. Of course, guidelines will be established, but um, yeah, there's not going to be any kind of ma major restrictive language in the, um, in the actual uh, statute. Thank you, Congressman. You're welcome, Nestor. Thank you, Nestor. We'll now move on and recognize uh, Mr. Phil Leon Guerrero from the Guam Daily Post. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. I, I just wanted to um, maybe explore a little bit more of the timeline beyond the reconciliation. So if reconciliation for uh, the money that you outlined in the bill is supposed to happen around next week, uh, when would further votes be held either on a committee level for the full house and then uh, mark up with the Senate? Very difficult to say, and only because there's multiple reconciliation packages in multiple committees. So for example, natural resources is already moving forward on September 2nd. Financial services, um, we haven't even begun to um, finalize the details yet on our package. So it's all going to depend on when the committees are able to push everything through. There is, um, leadership is advising um, the month of September and hopefully mid-September as, um, as a work period to be able to have the committees finalize their language. They can push it to budget as quickly as possible. So hopefully before or, or during, uh, before the end of September, we should have all the different packages <clears throat> moving into the budget committee. Uh, from there, the budget committee will be combing over all the things that passed to make sure that it conforms with the budget rules um, and then bringing it to the floor for vote. And then of course the Senate um, having to take it up. Uh, last year's American Rescue Plan um, moved forward in the first quarter of, of uh, 2021. Um, and so, but the process began in 2020. Um, again, similar to that, this process is beginning in 2021. Um, at the latest, we're going to see something materialize 2022, but um, it all depends on how quickly we're able to um, get uh, terms agreed to between the House and the Senate. I know the delay on the American Rescue Plan was a the Senate going back and forth with the House because again, as I mentioned earlier, the initial price tags were not agreed to from the onset. This is different. This reconciliation already has its initial price tags uh, agreed to. Um, the fundamental question though is going to be whether or not at the end of the day, we're gonna have the 50 Senate votes uh, to be able to pass what is agreed to. Uh, I can't, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know uh, uh, whether or not we're going to have that in the next three months or whether they're gonna, we're, we're gonna take another six months to get something through. Um, so it's very difficult to nail down a firm timeline, but I can say that relative to the timeline of last year where, we, where it took us all the way up until um, the following year, February, we should be getting something through before then, given the fact that the price tags have already been agreed to in advance. Uh, so just to make sure that I understand, none of the, um, the processes that you're describing are tied to the end of the fiscal year. The, the, Congressional action can take place October and beyond for this package. Yes, yes, these are different from um, these are different from um, appropriations uh, for fiscal year of um, uh, continued operations. Okay, and then um, if I could just uh, one more question, Congressman, and I'll let my other colleagues uh, take over. Um, I, I know that you were outlining the competing sort of priorities in the community to help uh, the island recover from uh, COVID, the tourism market rebound. Uh, if the governor can be convinced to uh, not dedicate the $300 million in her discretionary ARP funds for the hospital, um, I wanted to maybe give you a, a little bit of a chance to just outline maybe in your mind where some of that money could be going, considering that both the legislature uh, and, and some of our business uh, organizations have kind of outlined where they would like this $300 million to go, if not all to the hospital. Right, so basically, um, hypothetically, if, um, if we were to make that $300 million available for relief, what would I recommend we do with that? Um, you know, the entire uh, PUA program costs about $1 billion a year, right? And so $300 million will cover us through about one third of any calendar year. The, um, the situation on the ground with, with Delta, with tourism not recovering, um, we're going to need to figure out 
whether or not there's going to need, be a need for us to, to continue to support um, those who've been receiving unemployment. But, and I want to caveat this very carefully, we also need to balance it with the need for us to ensure that people are um, incentivized to go back to work. And so what I would recommend is a scaling of PUA um, to uh, funding the 300, using the 300 million as a, um, as a pool of resources to fund a continuity of a local unemployment program, which by the way, is something we should have set up <laughs> a year ago, you know, when we realized unemployment was something that's important in this community. Use it to be a pool of a continuity of unemployment, but scale it so that it's not based on what were the federal dollar amounts of the original PUA, and instead do it that's based on a median, um, a median type of income, and then scale it so that um, the, the PUA begins to um, reduce as tourism numbers increase or as economic activity increases. We need to have a formula that causes the PUA to adjust on a weekly, um, I would recommend a weekly basis maybe, or a bi-weekly basis, so that when it, we show economic recovery, tourism recovery, um, we, are, we reduce the, the um, unemployment benefits that we incentivize people going back to work. Another thing that we need to be doing um, in advance of those funds is, and, and I think this was mentioned by the legislature, if I'm not mistaken, I do recall um, Sam Shinahara from United Airlines mentioning this, we need to make sure we stand up our, our market in a way where it's not going to be um, unattractive uh, when we initially open our doors. I mean, think of it like a, a, a grand reopening, right? If you, know, you have a business that shuts down and they renovate or they go through some changes and they have a grand reopening, if in the grand reopening things aren't working, things are dusty, things are old, people are untrained, logistics is not, you know, happening, shelves aren't staying full. That's going to that's going to really turn off the initial um, experience of those who are, uh, are are visiting the establishment. Same thing goes for Guam, same thing goes for our tourism market. If we do not invest in getting our local businesses to be um, customer ready, fully customer ready, even when the first few are walking through the door, then those who walk through and have that bad experience are going to go back and say, "Hey, you know what?" Maybe we should check out, you know, the other destinations because this one's certainly not not ready for for us to be able to fully enjoy ourselves. And so um, that's something that's a reality that we're going to have to contend with. Um, the three hundred million, the six hundred million, the full six hundred million can be deployed also for that purpose. And so, you know, I know that you asked about three hundred million, but but the reality is everything that I've just talked about is actually ac applicable to the full six hundred million. So, you know, that's why I think the legislature is really frustrated about wanting to know where the money is going to go. I think that's why there's a lot of frustration in the community about how that money is going to be spent, because there's some very obvious needs now, today, and definitely in the, in the weeks and months ahead that, that absolutely those funds could be used for. And then, and then as a final note, and, but definitely not, not least, you know, the essential worker pay, you know. As I mentioned before in previous in, in previous press conferences, our essential workers were the ones that have kept us going all the way to this point. You know, um, we need to make sure that 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 effort is is recognized. I mean, even if it's just nominal, even if it's just almost symbolic, the absence of that is is not something that's going to bode well for us when those workers are are in a more robust economic circumstance and able to really weigh their options. On, on where they're going to go and where they're going to invest their time and their future. But thanks for that opportunity to provide that clarity, um, Phil. Thank you, Phil. Now we'll take about a minute or so um, to receive any more questions from our media partners for a second round. Mr. Tony Lamarano. Senator. You're now recognized. Senator, my apologies. Hey. Half a day, Congressman. Sorry, I, my video is not, my camera is not working, but uh, good morning to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It is, uh, isn't it? It's about, yeah, it's 12, 15 in the morning. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Senator. <laughs> so, you know, uh, the governor has uh, continually said uh, that, uh, you know, she's not putting a, a budget together for the 600 million because she's waiting for federal guidance. 
Now, are other states and jurisdictions not spending their money as a result of not getting uh, the necessary federal guidance? No, there's 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 a lot of guidance that's already gone out, Senator. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's guidance that said that you can use this for um, uh, an unemployment program for essential workers. Um, I believe several months ago, um, we had a, uh, a press conference where we kind of outlined some of the guidance that already came out from Treasury. So a lot of guidance has already um, has already come out on things that we can do. Um, I think the question remains, what are we waiting for? And um, you know, if there's something that the governor is waiting for in terms of guidance, I think she needs to be very clear about that so we can understand, look, you're holding up the whole 600 million. What are you holding it up for? If you already have A, B, C, D that you know you can do, why are you making all of that wait for something else? What are you waiting for specifically? So I think that that needs to be clarified because so much has already been authorized and all of that could be making its way into our community, helping our economy, creating more jobs, um, creating that job demand for PUA to be able to sunset and for people to go back to work. But the longer we wait um, on doing what we can do uh, for something that we're not sure of, um, yeah, we're, we're, really, we're really tying our own hands here at this point. So I know every other jurisdiction is absolutely rolling up those resources the way they can and the way they know how. Of course, there definitely um, there might be some questions they have that they're still waiting on, but they're absolutely not holding up their relief programs, um, waiting for for clarity on other things. They're rolling up the relief on the things they know they can roll the relief out on, and that's something that we need to do. I hope I answered your question, Senator. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we'll go back to Mr. Nestor from KUAM. He has a second question. You're recognized. Yes, thank you. Uh, Congressman, since um, you were the one who first made the announcement about the 100% EITC reimbursement, um, the legislature will be voting tonight on a bill which includes $35 million um, set aside for uh, of the EITC to pay to pay pay for um, the hospital. Uh, first, your your comment on that, and also um, there's some question whether or not the EITC is going to be advanced. Do you know anything about that? So, on the first question, um, I'm very very disturbed about the direction the legislature is taking because they're wanting to lock up that funding source uh, for debt service on a project that we don't even know really how much it's going to cost where it's going to go, or even what it's going to look like. You know, that, that EITC that we've been waiting decades to resolve is now going to be locked up for a black box project that we have no idea what it is that we're actually going to buy. I'm actually very suspicious as to why there's such an interest in trying to tie up the funding when we don't even know exactly what that funding is going to be tied up for. And again, I mentioned earlier the timelines. We're looking at a five to seven year project timeline with the first to one to three years being just planning and design. And so we don't need to borrow today and lock up that money today in order to meet those first, those first few phases. The charrette is gonna cost $3 million. Of the $35 million EITC, take 3 million and pay for the charrette. Take the other 32 million and do something that's gonna benefit the people of Guam now. Okay, after the charrette is done a year or two from now, Take the next 35 million, take out 10 million and pay for the planning and design. Once that's done and three or four years have lapsed, we would have had $120 million circulating into our economy or into our government from EITC that's not being locked up. And we would have been moving the project forward. And then when those two phases are done, then we can go out and say, we have a charrette, we have a plan, now we're going to finance it. And this is the actual dollar cost. And when we do that, in that interim, we can see what our final um, funding packages are going to be. Do we have $345 million in federal funds? Were we able to secure any other federal funds over the course of those three years? Remember, I've only been in office for three years. Over the course of those next three years, did we secure any other federal funds that might go to pay for this project? And once all of that is added up, paid for, and determined, then we can go out and say, okay, now this is what we might want to commit for this project. And by the way, this is how we're going to phase in the project. So instead of building everything all at once, we might do a phase one, a phase two, a phase three, and, and really just bring down the cost over the long term. So 
long answer to your to your very specific question. I feel like this is a rush to borrow. I feel like it's a commitment of resources at a time when resources are incredibly scarce. I'm highly suspicious as to why this is the direction that's being insisted upon after we've made it very clear, not only today in this, this um, forum, but in multiple instances, there's, there's much smarter, better ways for us to go about meeting this objective without compromising a, resources we've been, a resource we've been working so hard for decades to finally secure. On the second question of whether or not it's going to be advanced um, or not, um, my, 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 best, um, my best guesstimate on that is that if it is modeled after Section 30, which um, I would assume it would be, I don't see why they would reinvent the wheel, Section 30 is, a, is an advance over, um, uh, in, uh, for the ensuing year. So I would assume that they would model EITC after that. Um, because that's just what's been consistent. The, the other thing is that it wouldn't be too hard to model that because we already have a history of EITC payments. And so if we are going to model um, Section 30 and if we're going to do so using the history of EITC, it shouldn't be too difficult to do in advance. Um, but again, that ultimately is going to be decided by the Treasury. Um, I'm, I'm actually okay either way. My, my, my tendency, I would prefer, would actually be for maybe a reimbursement. And the only reason is because we have not been doing using Section 30 the way it was intended. Section 30 that comes into Guam was supposed to be used for the next fiscal year. But what we've been doing since Kingdom Come was using Section 30 to pay for uh, deficit spending in the government. And really, you know, that's not what it was for. It was not supposed to make up for, for prior year overspending. It's supposed to actually be for the coming years that we're not starting off the year in the hole. So, you know, if, if I had to choose between one or the other, I think that the better, the better option that would give us more fiscal discipline would be a reimbursement because then we're not going to be misspending the funds for other purposes. I know Speaker Talahi has tried, I think on four separate occasions in this budget process, to try and focus EITC in the tax refunds and has been unsuccessful. You know, and that's another, that's another red flag. You know, if you're not using that money to pay tax refunds, you know, and we're locking it up for borrowing that's not even going to be necessary over the next three to four, two to three years, you know, why, why are we doing all of this and, and, and why is it not making any financial sense? So um, I don't know, um, Nestor, if it's going to be a reimbursement or, a, or an advance, but um, the justification is there for both. I think though that the federal government does have a history of just using what's already established and uh, an advance is what's on the books for section 30. So it might not be too far fetched to assume that that's what's ultimately going to manifest with the ITC. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Nestor. Thank you, Nestor. Troy, you are now recognized. Thank you, uh, Congressman. Uh, I, I have a main question, but I wanted to follow up uh, some, something that you just talked about the, the section 30 um in your experience as a senator uh hasn't that um the the advance that happens prior to the start of a fiscal year screwed up a couple of things one gov guam's uh it, it creates an accounting mess for the executive branch and then it creates uh, a budgetary mess especially for the not so bright members of the legislature whenever you guys discuss budgets and stuff right i Honestly, I, I don't think it creates necessarily an accounting mess for the administration. I think it creates an accounting gimmick for the administration. Yeah. Where, yeah, um, yeah because I, I remember distinctly on multiple occasions, um, sitting down and having the budget hearings and always um, the debate going into, oh, no, that's appropriations. And then the next minute, oh, no, that's cash. And then, and then just um, jumping between the two um, to try and justify why they want to spend more on one hand, and then why they don't have the money to spend on the other. Mm -hmm. And so that lack of, of, of just of clarity, as you mentioned earlier, uh, for those who, um, who have a, a little bit more difficulty understanding the financial nuances, they kind of just throw their hands up in the air and say, okay, well, yeah, fine, whatever you're saying, because I don't want to look stupid by constantly asking the same question. But the reality yeah. is that if we don't have um, that kind of clarity, then, then that's when the political shell, shell games start happening. Um, one minute we have money for something because, oh, you know, the cash came in and the next minute we don't have money for something because, oh, you didn't appropriate for it or vice versa. So we, we got to stop that. Our people and our island, we need to be um, spending what we know we have 
in a manner that's clear and transparent to our people so that we can finally put these legacy issues to bed. We are now in a place where we've put the legacy excuses to bed. The money is there. The funding is there. The question now is what are we going to do and how are we going to do it so we can put the, the issues to bed? Because if the same shell games are going to be played with EITC the way they've been played with Section 30, then our people are going to suffer the same consequences and that's just going to be very sad. Uh, so thank, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that uh, and putting some perspective on that, Congressman. So the, my actual question uh, involved uh, going back to that, uh, your discussion about the infrastructure bill. Um, so uh, even though the funding was reduced nationwide by 50%, Guam got 100%, uh, bus shelters will be funded. I noticed there's, um, uh, the infrastructure bill does not provide funding for the building of schools. Um, the, the, the grants, the, the tens of millions or hundreds of millions that the Department of Education got, are they able to use any of that money, uh, seed money for building of schools or anything like that? And then my second question involves uh, the All Rise program. And I'll ask that once you're done with the education thing. Okay, so on the, on the American Rescue Plan funding for, for new schools, I'll need, to, I'll need to look back on that. Um, but I would assume that it would, it would be kind of falling under the same kind of difficult circumstances as using American Rescue Plan for a new hospital. Okay. You know, the funding was intended to meet um, relief and emergency needs, um, okay. you know, and, and obviously we still need to do that because as soon as Delta materialized, we went from being ready to open to our entire in-classroom learning collapsing and having to revert back to, to distance learning and then having to use a whole week to just reorientate everybody to do that. You know, we've, we've made available hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars specifically for education. They've had, you know, months to use that money to be ready for us to be able to open safely and to, you know, make sure everyone's going to be okay. And then we just, I mean, it was like immediately on day one, everything just kind of collapsed. And so, um, yes, we need to fund the rebuilding of schools. I think that we need to really focus those relief funds on, on, on doing what we need to do to make sure students are still learning and getting educated. I'm so worried about a serious lost generation in education. Last year was already really bad. Um, continuing that going forward is just really, really, really scary um, because as, as behind as we've been um, educationally in terms of test scores and, and outcomes, you know, there, I think that this is going to just further, further um, exacerbate that gap where countries and districts and states and territories, those that roll out their funds and get their education system to properly fill the gap during these hard times are going to really get leaps and bounds ahead of those who are just, you know, kind of, you know, making it day by day. And so that's just a real, a real area of concern that we, we need to, we need to be mindful of. I do want to um, uh, get back to all of you folks. Again, as I mentioned earlier, as we get more firm information on relief funding, I wanna see what's, gonna, what's going on in the education committee. I wanna see if that, that, that uh, reconciliation package is going to include um, specific dollars for school funding. And we'll be sure to let everybody know if we are able to firm up that resource um, on the education committee side. Thank you. And then uh, my, uh, my lastly, Congressman, uh, tomorrow at 7 a.m., there's anticipated to be a mad rush to file the application for the All Rise program, both over at Revenue Tax and uh, online. Uh, and uh, that has to do with the cap on the funding. Are you uh, suggesting to the governor that, uh, would you suggest to the governor uh, that she use a portion of that $600 million that she has to lift that cap? Absolutely. There's really no reason why there is a cap. Um, it's not like there's a lack of resources. You know, if the original if the original amount was going to be 30 million, and even if we have double that, it's 60 million, and that's not even 10% of the 600 million. So, and, and it's going to be coming out at a time when you know people are, are really reaching a, a pretty desperate point. Um, so, absolutely, let's let's not let's not. Why are we capping that? That's totally not federal. The federal government didn't say cap that. You know, I have no idea why we are capping something that is not, um, you know, that is not being limited to, you know, certain certain groups. I mean, anybody who applies that is eligible should get and to just say, oh, you're not going to get because we capped it. And unfortunately, you are number, you know, number 100 in the line that only was able to service 99. 
that does not in any way make them less eligible. So, you know, I, I'm, I don't know. I don't know why that cap is in place. Um, I don't know why we're distressing our people unnecessarily of those kind of things when the resources are already provided to make it happen and to make everybody feel more confident and to feel more secure rather than creating that kind of panic. And, and, and just on a, on a closing note to that, Troy, when we are in a situation where Delta is requiring both vaccinated and unvaccinated to be extra cautious, putting our people into a mad rush to the line situation where you better get there first come first serve, otherwise you're not gonna get it, is not conducive to social distancing and mitigating crowds. You know, the last thing we need is for people to get up in other people's faces and shouting at them because why are you cutting the line? Or, you know, I just went to go to the bathroom and I came back and, you know, that's just all unnecessary. We need to make things as fluid for our people and as safe for our people as possible. And that's just not what the, the cap is going to do and the mad rush is going to do um, the way with the, with the way this program is being rolled out. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you for your input. Thank you for your questions, Troy. At this time, I'd now like to recognize a participant by the name of APPS SPB. Am I correct in stating that you're representing PNC and K57? Congressman, you're, you're muted. That is Sorensen Pacific Broadcasting. That should be um, PNC and K57. Hello, we'd like to clarify if uh, you still had a question on behalf of a constituent. They did state that they had a caller call in uh, with a question, so we wanted to follow up on that. K57. Yes, there, there's no questions here. Thank you, you're now recognized. You may ask your question. I think they said that there is no question. Yeah, there's no, we no, don't have a question. We're sorry about that. Okay. So we'd like to take a moment now if uh, there are any outstanding questions. Okay, we do have a Phil Leonguero from Guam Daily Post. He raised his hand. Uh, thank you. Uh, Congressman, if, if I could uh, switch tracks just a little bit, uh, still federally related, I promise. Um, with everything that's going in Afghanistan, considering that you and other members of Congress, the governor advocated for Guam to take a part in the uh, Afghan refugee evacuation. I'm just trying to get an update from you uh, if you've been given, given any indication that it's just not happening for Guam, that, that we're not going to be seeing and, or hosting any refugees. It's my understanding that the um, evacuation has concluded at this time and that Guam has not received any Afghan refugees as part of the um, organized evacuation. Um, my understanding is that we've made it very plain that Guam is, um, is, is ready to be a participant and to facilitate in, uh, in, in this effort. Um, and, we, and we did not um, mince words when we made it very clear that that's something that uh, the people of Guam, um, you know, are, in our pride and in our, in our support are absolutely willing to do for those who've helped our, our, our sons and daughters, brothers and sisters while they were in the combat zone. Um, but that being said, uh, the, uh, the actual evacuation plan that was rolled out did not uh, have Guam as a, as a staging destination. They used other destinations to include um, some East Coast destinations out here. Uh, they, I, I was very clearly um, uh, reassured that if at any point in time it was going to change and Guam was going to be involved, our office was going to be informed, um, but that, that notice never came. And so it's clear that the uh, evacuation um, took a different track using different resources, uh, but we were very proud to make um, Guam and our capabilities available, even though it wasn't necessary uh, for that purpose at this time. Uh, and then my final question, Congressman, is uh, the island has been hosting a bunch of military exercises, international military exercises as well. Um, I, it is my understanding that the policy of, of the Department of Defense for both uh, domestic and foreign military service members is in order for them to go beyond the borders of a military installation to go out into town for liberty, that these service members would have to be vaccinated. But uh, and I'm not uh, trying to apply any causation or correlation here, but just considering that there were uh, increases in cases through the duration of these exercises, I wanted to give you an opportunity to 
uh, maybe instill some confidence in continuing this or if you had any concerns about it to share? Well, I think that, um, you know, of course, having the requirement for them being vaccinated makes sense. Uh, and I'm glad that the Department of Defense was very adamant about making sure that was the case. The, um, the situation that we're dealing with on Guam in terms of the, the virus and, and people getting sick has, has more to do with um, us just doing everything we can to stay as safe as possible and has, has less to do with, you know, whether or not you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. I have not seen anything that shows that a vaccinated person is, when, when sick, is less of a carrier to make other people sick than an unvaccinated person. And so as far as transmission, um, that's just, I mean, I, I haven't seen anything that says that they're less communicable. Um, when, when, but as far as whether or not they have a less, a less chance of getting sick, of course, we've seen the data that does back that up. My point is um, vaccination or non-vaccination, we all gotta be careful. Uh, we, if we get sick, if we are carriers, it, it, we can make other people sick. Um, so as far as the ships and, and the um, and the soldiers coming in, the sailors coming in, uh, I'm very, very glad they are vaccinated. That means that they're not going to be um, inundating any healthcare systems. Um, it also means that um, if they were vaccinated and they've been on the ship and they traveled over to here, and of course that travel may have taken X number of days, uh, if they are still asymptomatic, it's very unlikely that they were carrying the disease outside of the base, um, being, um, you know, being um, without symptoms uh, when they're departing. Um, and, and, and bottom line is, we don't have any visitors. And so all of that economic activity that's happening with all those vaccinated patrons is no different than all the economic activity that we can generate from vaccinated um, locals and residents also going out into the community. So um, I really don't see the, the, um, the situation as being something negative. I think that the, the requirement for vaccination was in, in fact a positive. And um, you know, I think that those, those exercises in these past few months have been the, the, the real few uh, opportunities we have had to keep, as I mentioned earlier, our economic engine, you know, the wheels turning so that we're not building up grease and we're not going to break down and, and fall apart when we actually need to fire that engine back up again. So, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm, 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 I do want to encourage everyone to please get vaccinated. Um, that would absolutely make it less likely that you're going to, to, to really, you know, suffer, although there's no guarantee. Um, but whether you're vaccinated or not, um, take all the precautions you possibly can, because we can vaccinate it or unvaccinated, we can still spread the sickness and we need to make sure we minimize that, especially with this Delta variant. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Phil. I believe uh, Nestor had another question. Yeah, just real quick. Um, I just uh, received, uh, I guess we all did receive a, 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 a release from the governor's office uh, regarding the uh, budget reconciliation package. And if I could just read one of the quote, quotes from the governor, and she wrote that when I met with the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, Raul Grijalva, on July 27th, he specifically assured me that he would include funding in the reconciliation, reconciliation package for Guam's hospital, as well as other territories in the insular areas. I thank him for this, uh, his commitment and passion to help the people of Guam. Chairman Grijalva has been a longstanding advocate and ally. Um, so basically, she's assigning the credit to um, the congressman the chairman from Arizona. I was wondering if you could comment on that. I'm having technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear you? Yes, sir, we can yeah, hear I'm having you. Technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes sir. Did you, uh, did you hear the question? Do you want me to repeat? Apologies, everyone. I believe the Congressman is logging back in. He had to um, log out and log back in to uh, resolve the technical issues. Please give us a moment. Mic check one, two, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. I'm sorry, I had to, I, I can
Uh, sir, we cannot hear you. Sir, I believe you might be muted. Our sincere apologies, everyone. Please give us a moment. Third time's the charm. Let me try this one more time. Hello. Yes, we got you, sir. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, as we mentioned earlier, we've been we've been working on this for months. So um, the message that was passed on by um, uh, is not inconsistent with um, with what we're sharing. Um, that just uh, underscores the point. If we are, if that commitment is on the table, why are we holding that money? Um, on the 600 million, not developing a plan and working with the legislature to roll those funds out for relief, for essential workers, for unemployment, you know? So I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the purpose of that press release is, given that the information is consistent, but it does create the, um, it does underscore that the question, Governor, if that money, if you already knew that money was going to be committed, why are you still holding your 300 million back? You know, I hope that that, uh, I hope that that's a forbearing, a forbearance of what we're, we're, we're hopeful to see and more relief coming to our people because they're they're just really really struggling right now I, i'm sorry are you able to hear me still uh yes thank yes, you sir. thank you Congressman. okay i was like oh no <laughs> okay thank you everyone thank you nestor um if there are no further questions uh i'd like to return the floor to congressman St. nicholas for some closing remarks well, again, thank you guys so much for um, for making time. I, and I, 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 what I thought was going to be a simple press release item obviously was more worthy of a, of a press conference item. So I thank our media partners for uh, requesting an opportunity for some Q&A. Um, and thank you for making your, your platforms available on such short notice. Again, I'd like to thank our staff for um, scrambling the operation um, in such short notice for us to be able to do this. Uh, I am in DC right now, and it is about 1245 in the morning. But uh, as always, we'll make ourselves available to, to answer any questions, give our people any kind of guidance, and provide any kind of perspective based on, on what we know the realities are on the ground, and um, what the resources we're looking to secure um, can be used for in the greater context of all the other resources that have already been put on the table. Um, we, we, won't, we won't bring things to you that we're not, we, we don't feel like they have traction and a likelihood of, of success. Um, all these items that we outlined in this particular press conference, we will continue to keep you informed of um, as, we, as we progress forward. Um, specific to the natural resources funding and the 345 million for the hospital. Again, we do have a markup hearing on the 2nd of September in the next few days, uh, and we will be notifying our media partners and the public um, of the outcome of that. Uh, but again, thank you all very much for making the time and um, stay safe, Guam, please. Uh, let's, let's do everything we can to, to try and keep our, our, our numbers our numbers down and um, you know keep, keep our community safe. And, and if you're not vaccinated, please consider doing so. Uh, we just we, we just need I, I want to be able to, to enjoy you know everybody's company um, many, many years from now. And, and the more we can do to, to ensure that, the better. So thank you all very much for the opportunity. See you as